Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this very warm welcome, Arun. Also, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's very, very wonderful to join you today, and I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity to share my work and hopefully also enter in conversation with some of you here today. Before I begin, I wanted to very, very briefly acknowledge all of the work and care that has gone into this hybrid meetup. And I want to thank the organizing team that has put this whole event together with such care. So Kate, Kristen, Delaney, Sherry, and certainly others, thanks a lot. I will uh, share my slides now. And I just wanted to mention that um, the talk works perfectly well without them as well. So if you find them for some reason confusing or overwhelming, that is not a problem at all. And feel free to maybe just uh, listen if you like. Um, so as Arun has just mentioned, I have shifted from the university to the arts and my practice has kind of always situated itself in between. So I wanted to, um, when I deliver this talk today, I will be talking about kind of both my older work, but also give some projections onto how I've been uh, talk, uh, how I've been thinking about AI in the last year and a half or so. And I wanted to give you a very, very brief sum up of um, the work that I did before kind of transitioning into what I am calling uncertain intelligences. And firstly, um, I wanted to mention my monograph, which was published with Punctum Press last year, titled Feminist Solidarities After Modulation. This is a book where I interrogate the propositions of German media theory, which has been projecting a kind of universal we into how media and technology act upon the body and the subject. And now this is a we that is often not only technologically determined, but also suspiciously unnamed. And as a result has been, or as I've worked on, has is oftentimes very normative. And Sylvia Winter, the Caribbean philosopher, has called this an overrepresentation of the human in the figure of man, meaning that man comes to stand in for a humanity and shapes it in its normative form. And the work aquí se centra una historia más larga el supposedly universal figure and how it is co-constructed through technology in concert with and emerging through colonialism and how embodied media practices today contest that framework through different forms of inhabitations of the digital. In the two books you see on the right hand side, uh, I collaborated with two colleagues at the TU Dresden to continue along these lines of thought. And uh, these are edited volumes that think about whether or not a queer AI could exist or how AI and technology more generally uh, intersect with queerness or how both these kind of uh, universes shape e each other and potentially stand in tension to each other. And as you can maybe see, one of the books is an English language volume that focuses on more international questions. And the other is a German language volume, which is also focused in particular on the German um, on the German context. And you should be able to get all of these books open access. So if you would like to be read them and are interested in hearing more after this talk or reading more after this talk, um, please go ahead. Uh, if you cannot find them online, let me know and I'm happy to send across a PDF. So these books share a view of technology that is situated in material, but also social. With Sylvia Winter, I argue that technologies have increasingly been deployed to shape the stories of what it means to be human. And as Sylvia Winter puts it, the mythoi that accompany the bios. And in my new book project, I am developing this notion of technological mythoi further. And what I'm sharing today are some of the working notes that I have compiled over the last year and a half or so, as I mentioned, consolidated into what might become the basis for a first chapter. Then we'll talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and to give you a very, very brief overview, my first part will concentrate on this technology colonialism nexus and why these two need to be thought together within the current applications of AI. And then in the second part, I will connect these to the uh, reflections and analyses to a more speculative projection of what my AI could be, which I am exploring through the ideas of uncertain intelligence. So. When Elon Musk was asked in 2022 why AI-driven vehicles were still causing so many accidents, Musk stated that this is the case because nothing is where it's supposed to be. He was referring to, I assume, people crossing the street in places other than traffic lights or crossovers, to roadworks or animals, to, weathers, to the weather and the many things that happen in the chaotic reality of urban and suburban settings. 
But even in this very quotidian scenario, nothing is where it's supposed to be, reveals a quite unusual way of encountering the cultural realities of any social space. Looking at the larger reality of AI, the phrase is telling not just because of Musk and because of what he stands for, but because it actually stands for an entire ideological apparatus that has been a driving force behind technological development at the very least since the burst of the dot-com bubble in 2001. So this implies the emergence of Web 2.0 and of new media networks in the form of big data. And um, this belief relies on and propagates the idea that new technologies and AI development in particular will serve to assess, and this is important, completely and accurately human behavior across settings because it has access to so much data that it need no longer rely on speculation or interpretation. With enough data, the model will be able to fully and accurately represent reality, finally realizing a much desired departure from the famous phrase by statistician George Box, who claimed all models are wrong, but some are useful. With AI, it is believed that models are not wrong, but actually accurate, which is, as I will hopefully convincingly argue, not the same as right. Uh, it is this concept of accuracy with which AI can successfully model the real. It is this concept of accuracy with which then editor-in-chief of Wired magazine, Chris Anderson, proclaimed, as you see here in the slide, the end of theory. And this was in 2008. With models so big that they encompass the whole world, Anderson stated boldly at the time that correlation would equate causation and that we would no longer need to ask why something is simply because we would know that it is. This understanding of knowledge production on the human, where correlation becomes causation, should not only anger anyone in the humanities, but it reveals a continued ideology that drives the tech industry to this day. It is also seeping into scientific discourse around AI. It is unsurprising, as it is appalling, that Anderson ends his article with an invitation for scientists to start listening to Google. In the same vein, nothing is where it's supposed to be, proposes that the world can be fully modeled and that this model will be accurate and infallible, that it will be an end to all doubt, ambivalence and questioning if only people behaved according to what the algorithm were proposing as best. I would like to contextualize these claims as evocative of the most recent shift in how new media are understood. Uh, for this, I draw upon K. Alado McDowell's observation that situates AI models within a contemporary new media paradigm, what, AI, uh, what Alado McDowell has called neural media. Neural media are the latest form of an ongoing departure from broadcast media, so TV, radio, and so on, as media modeled on the self. And um, neural media has shifted this media self relation to a paradigm that incorporates the network media form of post 2001 so web 2.0 uh, which itself consisted of more fragmented and networked selves and a lot of mcdowell has termed this the shift to self as model so while broadcast media was a media that modeled onto a projection of the self that was a consistent identity so a top-down model of identity for example broadcast media that was predefined for a certain gender or a certain other, other type of uh, class or other type of uh, taxonomy. The self as model paradigm proposes a set of very fragmented taxonomies that create group identities beyond biology and in seemingly more flexible and unstable processes. Um, K. Lado McDowell mentions memes as a form of relation uh, that, that we relate to as an identity, so hashtag short hands and so on, and that they all propose that there is a form of social cohesion that comes from the content and, and that the form kind of uh, networks. So there is a certain content that we all kind of identify with, and the form makes it uh, circulate across certain networks where other people uh, can also buy into this kind of templated form of recognition and identity. And I have also discussed um, in more detail Me Too as a form of fragmented and networked self-expression. And in this network uh, media paradigm, individuals act as nodes that process and guide the model's social boundaries. So for example, the content that was shared via Me Too was formally similar, individuals sharing their stories, um, that were validated in their group identity through a recognition of the simil similarity within the other and the hashtag me too. I read these collective iterations as a reworking of how we might understand identity politics as a collective articulation in public space, 
as a mode of resistance that can only happen through a sharing of concerns, which produces strategic and temporarily limited collective identity. Kay Alado McDowell seems perhaps equally, if not more optimistic, as Alado McDowell sees older and more binary modes of identification according to biological markers to be less and less important in this shift. And uh, Kay has claimed that individuals can self-model their group identities more freely according to their own ideologies and fragmented positionalities. However, one important aspect of the neural media shift is that the algorithm talks back. Instead of having to simply accept or reject the models that are out there, neural media have given rise to speculations about an unconscious within. Chatbots and image generators have since become the sites that seem to reveal and make accessible to us a deeper form of truth, a form of truth about ourselves and potentially also about the other. And the shift thus departs from the user bodies as nodes and checkpoints that feed and direct data. It is not so much the case anymore that we are the ones processing information through our bodies, but rather that we believe that AI can reveal a deeper underlying truth to ourselves that we did not necessarily know about. Instead of being able to shape the network, the individual thus inhabits or interacts with neural media in a form that is pacified. We are told the truth about ourselves, which supposedly comes from within, from a user, user unconscious, or from the habits and practices of engaging with AI that have created the AI to begin with. Given this new quality of power that connects AI and other neural media with our own bodies, I believe that what Kay describes as a turn to neural media does not indeed depart from, but actually internalizes and politicizes accuracy as a form of identification turned identity. Thus also continuing a return rather than a departure from the taxonomy dictum that I have also observed within earlier forms of media. While network media allow for a higher frequency of self-modeling, in opposition to K, I see the high dimensionality of neural media to create accuracy, perhaps a little bit like horoscopes do. So addressing something that is presumed to be specific and individual in a way that produces confirmation bias on a normative scale. The inward turn of the neural media shift that Kay describes then might depart from biology, but it is in line with a larger societal shift that privileges the culturalization of politics, biology, and identity, and as a result also of forms of racism and sexism that emerge from the colonial encounter and become tacit, with, tacit within new media forms, but no less powerful. To put it more clearly, Categories of race and gender were never just there, but they were always already actively created with and through discursive paradigms, one of which was biology as science. And if we think of, for example, phrenology, the idea, the racist science that the shape of your head tells you something about the quality of your intellect or other colonial sciences that judged and ranked humans according to certain exterior features um, that would supposedly shed light on interiority. Landa Schiebinger has convincingly shown how these uh, older experiments in creating taxonomies have always already carried uh, political aims. The colonies are the best example of the volatility of these taxonomies as well, as colonized populations were included in the archives, if we were to understand them as yesteryear's data sets, only when their body features corresponded with the racist fantasies of colonial scientists. So, um, this confirmation bias, again, is something that corresponds with data practices, such as the company Booz Allen that worked for the United States government uh, that had demarcated an AI's finding that Middle Eastern 20-somethings were staying in luxury hotels across the US as dirty data. And uh, Hito Steyer has written on this more extensively. So biology as science and now technology as science takes certain phenomena that were, understand, that were understood as central for certain types of distinctions and taxonomies and the way that these distinctions have been altered over time attests to the way in which biology as science, just as technology as science, relies on technological development and also readings and interpretations of the things that are out there and that are put in certain frameworks. AI accuracy and with it the reductive potential of science as technology takes these ambivalent and politically motivated taxonomies and projects and projects them as an ahistoric norm. What AI identifies then is nothing more than sense certainty, a term which Hegel uses to describe the most naive form of empirical observation. 
I want to very briefly add that I'm not a Hegelian and uh, I have been in discussion with uh, many Hegelians on this term and I thank in particular Delicia and Antoinette Kamens who has turned me towards this framing of what AI identification does. AI thus captures a self that in the moment of its iteration is no longer there because it has transmuted into something else. AI, possibly like any interpolative form, captures only an identity that was part of an ambivalent real reality from the very start, but its neural form promises a sort of inner authenticity that network media has failed to provide. It is this mode of knowing which is centralized within the neural media form, much rather than creating an in-depth account of how identity paradigms are part of and need to be understood through longer histories, the accuracy or perhaps certainty paradigm of AI models remains within a normative framework and rearticulates the status quo. And I think some of you might know this example uh, that was discussed quite prominently, um, which was the incident in which Joy Bonamwini, a black computer scientist, discovered that her Aspire face filter did not in fact recognize her face. Um, this Aspire mirror was designed by Bonamwini to uh, be an app that, and I quote from the website, maps a reflection on your face based on what inspires you or what you hope to empathize with. Um, Bulamwini realized that the technology was biased when the off-the-shelf facial recognition software did not actually recognize her. So her black face was, un was what made her unintelligible to the machine. And instead she had to put on a proverbial white mask upon which the software identified her immediately. And I think you can see it on the slide all the way on the right. So the model as self paradigm that Kay describes in this example reveals itself through the form of whiteness as model. Although there is no necessity to rely on any biological features, the model fails to recognize a face that lies outside of what it has learned as a, hu a human face to look like. Rather than depart from a biocentrism that focuses on supposedly neutral binaries or natural binaries, this fortifies and ontologizes the taxonomies that were first created to model human social hierarchies according to pre existing ideas of racial separability. And I have mentioned the colonial sciences and taxonomies that created and objectified differences, oftentimes conflating exterior markers such as facial features and the shape of the skull with essentialized ideas about interior characteristics such as intelligence or the potential to be civilized. And I think that this is a really crucial point that drives home the volatility and ambivalent structures of what data and analysts refer to as accuracy. What is accurate is not so much what the data produces, but how the model asserts itself with regard to the common sense. So a superficial form of sense certainty. Of course, this form of algorithmic bias where computer visions fail to recognize certain people is problematic. Joy Bolomwini has pointed out that algorithms need to be trained on data sets that include faces of black people so that black people can participate in the benefits these technologies offer. And this is in line with the model self relation that Elado McDowell proposes. The self is used as a basis from which the model is supposed to be created. And it is understandable that there is a standing desire to be included and represented in the data set, um, because of course there are many, many cases uh, that, that are, go way beyond them, things as simple and quotidian as unlocking your phone or using face filters on Instagram. Um, as you can see with these headlines, AI technologies are implemented in more foundational questions of access and inclusion, such as access to food subsidies, to jobs, and so on. Uh, we are stuck in a moment in which the modus of identification as certainty forces us to take on and inhabit pre-existing models, whether we like it or not. However, I think that the response that has become common in such cases is perhaps just as problematic and actually goes along the same vein of Musk's initial claim that everything may have a concrete and distinctive place or in this case positionality. In taking on such a relation as the foundation to the neural media shift, we can identify a problem that seeks to return to that seems to return to the very psychosocial situation that Franz Fanon describes in Black Skin White Masks. Black identity as Bulamwini is seeking to assert it is caught between the ideological capture of the white norm and the neurosis of otherness. 
It is offered a space within the neural media paradigm merely in terms of pre-existing projections. So even if there are certain bodies that are formally allowed to exist and be included within technological spaces, um, the, these existences are pathologized and made intelligible through problematic and as Fanon would say, neurotic forms. When Budomwini and others then ask to be included in the data set, this is not wrong on, on an everyday uh, political understanding of the technology, but it reasserts the colonial paradigms of recognition that have framed self-model relationships. In fact, these are actualized, but only to assign pre-existing frameworks and understandings of race and gender onto the bodies that enter the data set. The self-model relationship continues to be a hierarchical one. So the proposition of inclusion holds on to some form of representational accuracy that can seemingly supposedly be ameliorated through better data. While the technology can formally reflect on and go on to recognize black faces, once they are added to the data set, it leaves intact the larger structure that has been put in place to weaponize this inclusion at other moments and in other settings, the structures that now inform the neural media paradigm. I think here, for example, of surveillance cameras that oftentimes wrongfully over-identify black people as perpetrators, over-identifications that have previously been recognized and problematized in older forms of media representation of the self. And I think of, for example, the Rodney King trial, which you may or may not be familiar with, uh, and which Judith Butler has analyzed in detail in her text, Endangered Endangering. In the early 90s, Rodney King suffered brutal forms of police violence after having been put under arrest for speeding and later charged with felony, with felony evasion. A witness filmed the incident from their balcony and sent the footage out to the press. When the case was circulated and the police went, men put on trial, three out of four were acquitted. Rather than affirm what the tape had clearly shown, the documentation of police brutality um, was turned against King. His body was deemed violent despite video footage recording a helpless and defenseless King being struck while lying crumpled on the floor. The footage was positive to assure not the police violence we could witness on screen, but the police's vulnerability in opposition to a black body always already perceived as dangerous and unruly. King was, as Butler writes, and I quote, presupposed dangerous before any gesture was made. And this means that the evidence of a def defenseless black man being beaten was not enough to acquit him of the charge that has historically been put on his body due to his blackness. So while in theory it is true that technology may actively serve the dispossessed and marginalized, this focus on technology as apparatus blends out the larger social structures in which these technologies are implemented and become objective processes of information as truth. King's story reverberates with the various cases of facial recognition technologies that wrongfully identify black people as perpetrators or the daily occurrences of racial pro profiling in public space that have led to the many cases fuel, that fueled the Black Lives Matter movement all across the world. If AI continues to correlate black faces with deviance, then the mere fact of their recognition and inclusion in the data set will not alter that correlation, but harmfully serve to normalize it. Returning to the initial statement by Musk, uh, nothing is where it's supposed to be inadvertently affirms this model as the desirable reality Black people, and in fact, all people are annoying and pose faults in AI when they deviate from their place already presupposed. This is particularly har harrowing in the face of automated driving, where failing to recognize a human as human can and has actually had lethal effects. Where AI treated as a person, company negligence, or even Musk's way of seeing the world would effectively translate into racially motivated murder. Any refusal to be read and identified in this way thus becomes an obstruction to the smooth operation that legitimizes exactly that process of the neuromedia landscape. When it comes to race, and I would argue more tacitly gender, the body is presupposed and the model has always been the only intelligible form of the self that racialized bodies may inhabit. Um, the neuromedia paradigm in this way turns this form of colonial accuracy inward, asking us to interrogate our approximations of the model down to our most frivolous beliefs of giving accurate accounts of ourselves. Given this very seeping and insidious forms of accuracy as sense certainty that neural media propose and creators propagate, the forms of recognition available to the technologized self 
serve mostly to reassert colonial modalities of accuracy, precisely because AI's functionality is dependent on an accurate recognition of an identity already presupposed. This is in itself part and parcel of a colonial apparatus that historically identifies the, colo the colonized as fallen out of history, as incapable of change or development. No matter how diverse the database from which neural media can depart, the unchanging and closed characteristics of these datasets and the taxonomies they have already presupposed serve to center normalcy and capture and make deviant any sense of change. But of course, despite all its structural and implicit, uh, explicit forms of violence, colonialism was never a totalizing or, uh, total, or a total structure. Otherwise, the centuries of resistance against it would not have happened. Coloniality is marked by ongoing step attempts to foreclose an infinite number of uncertainty and gaps, which have historically always already marked the avenues of resistance that, that lie at the core of colonial forms of governance or at the core of resisting these colonial forms of governance from the start. And it's here where I find the basis for a productive form of resisting and refusing colonial forms of technologized recognition and modes of self that I have tentatively referred to as uncertain intelligences. Uncertainty as a paradigm draws upon neural me media's tendency to hallucinate, so to generate information when data is unclear or missing. Hallucination suggests that the unclear or missing data is not a factual error, but as a matter of fact, a form of structural productivity that belongs in the realm of being outside of oneself, of forgetting the given reality for the sake of another. More importantly, hallucination actually uh, describes the neurons, neurons firing off in your brain more than a relationship to truth. So what does hallucinating AI tell us about technological certainty and what does this long critique have to do with my promise to talk about anti-colonial and queer identity formations? Hallucination, when we are no longer certain about something being true or accurate, opens up identity as a form of uncertain intelligence, a more sensorial, contextualized and somewhat specific form of identity that is perhaps not representational in the visual regime of computation, but speaks instead to a more visceral and effective way of, of knowing. Um, I believe that this would mean that neural medias could potentially produce self models via dreams, sensitivities, and the fleeting non-locality of what Denise Ferreira da Silva has called difference without separability, a self that understands itself as always already connected, relational, and inseparable from the neural network it is connected to and that it is that it requires for its emergence. Um, I think that the arts are one place in which such a self can be articulated and a place to intervene into and relate differently to AI in a way that focuses on practices and allows for ambivalences or at the very least does not reaffirm certain hegemonic modalities of identity or top-down strategies of inclusion. And what you could notice then is that when AI is shaped in such a way, the directionality, intent, and purpose of AI too shifts in a way that could translate into more radical and emancipatory understandings of technology that are perhaps not decolonial but anti-colonial and queer, and that they in that they problematize the certainty principle that conflates AI models that are created in line with top-down self-model relationships with something as complex and mutable as race and gender. So I read this refusal of the accuracy, accuracy paradigm as a refusal of what Glenn Coulthard has called the liberal forms of recognition. And it is fascinating to me that even ChatGPT is participating in some extent. For example, when it hallucinates book titles that I've been wanting to read or that are books that have never been written, I think that we can uncover other genealogies and with it other modes of computation that exit the formal logics that colonial epistemologies have imposed. This does not mean that there is no logic to the things we understand as hallucinations, but we just approach them, or we should at least, with a more aware sense of interpretive uncertainty that is actually inherent to all forms of knowledge. And certain intelligences thus seeks to excavate and center on intelligence as a mode of relating rather than a mode of capture. It circumvents accuracy for a more embodied, emotive, and potentially caring inhabitation of technologies. 
I use the term uncertainty because I think there is a vulnerability to it, an acknowledgement of standpoint and embodiment and of the emotional and effective paradigms working within knowledge that are not the opposite of rationality, but they are the id internal to and at the core of any concept and idea of rationality. And I'm not the only one that has seen these questions play out within AI technology and other neural media forms. Since 2019, the Indigenous Protocols and AI Working Group has held a series of workshops from which they have published a position paper and a series of other materials relating to developing AI technologies in concert with Indigenous cosmologies. Indigenous cosmologies, although they are particular in their specificities, oftentimes share a foundational belief in the vibrancy and spiritedness of the world. And um, this is a principle that has also come up every now and then with scholars of science and technology studies or new materialism. Um, kind of bringing these, these, these different disciplines together, there is something this relation seems to suggest that crosses in acknowledging the liveness of stones, trees and rivers and the liveness of AI. And my research of late has focused on this intersection to think about what kind of AI ethics would emerge from the scope that I see very much in line with my proposition of uncertain intelligence. And one of the um, members of this indigenous AI position paper is the researcher and uh, artist Kite, uh, a Lakota artist, who is um, currently working with me and uh, performs together with computers to make accessible indigenous dreams and contemplation through data sets. In the performance pieces by Kite, uh, the artist explores the collective modalities of being that are enabled through relations emerging between stones and stars, seen and unseen, and land and cosmos. One performance shows Kite performing a set of poetic iterations while the motion sensor in the form of a hair braid responds to the bodies moving in space, translating their movements into versions of the visual score that Kite uses to train the generative AI the score that is both a form of pattern according to which to develop modes of recognition, but also a sonic performance pre-recorded by an indigenous orchestra that Kite collaborates with. The individuals within the performance, so the visitors are made to listen and through listening can find themselves participating in this audiovisual performance. The collectivity is, is the moment of self-modeling that remains uncertain, embodied and collective. According to Kite, this performance technically produces infinite meaning because the process of how the collective patterns emerge can theoretically be ongoing. It is not that the patterns capture some fundamental truth, but rather show an infinite capacity for change and for nuance, despite what may appear to be similar or the same at first. The anomaly is thus celebrated as it points towards a fleeting productivity, a potential that is yet to be asserted in its relationality. Kaito centers on the seeming irrational core of identity and rationality. She works with a neuroscientific model of the psyche that emerges from indigenous traditions of her communities, from being with one another, from dreaming and from imagining. And it is here that a sociality emerges in and with machines and the indigenous cosmologies that animate a different form of encountering the other through hallucinations of understanding as neural capacities for transformation rather than presupposed modes of self model relations. So to put it very think simply, we have to think about how the experience with machines potentially enacts itself upon our bodies. And in each moment that we listen and open up ourselves to this relationality of dreaming and speculative AI, something can happen that potentially alters us and alters our sense of reality. When speaking about uncertain intelligences, I want to thus create a vision of AI that might cater to dreams and desires rather than shape and pressure us. And a first step towards that, I would say, is letting go of the certainty and accuracy paradigms driving the discourse around what was previously called big data to think more about collective frameworks in which, in which we might be addressed more clearly as part of a, as AI, as part of our bodies, and as a central mythoid that is articulating what it means to be human today. So uh, instead of relying on normativity, working groups such as the indigenous protocols think about technology that serve and relate to human life and practices instead of functioning as a tool for colonial capture. And I end with this quote uh, by Kite, 
where she says the anomaly is very important in indigenous thought for a very large extent, humans limit ourselves and our data intake to a state of awakeness. In the native world, and she refers to her own, but also the Blackfoot world, where the spectrum from which we take data can be so much broader. So yes, dreams, for instance, are a basis of data intake because they are actually a real experience. And in some humans are more often than not tuned into only certain parts of the radio dial, as Leroy Little Bear has called it, and Kite proposes that perhaps we have lost some of the technology for tuning in. I think I will end here, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Also, any questions with regards to clarification, if you want to drop me a line, here's my email address. Um, thank you very much.